This is mini lecture 2.3, Hook Through Pasture. Microbiology has a very rich history. We're going to talk about some of the more important highlights of the history of microbiology. We're certainly not going to hit everything uh, and we're not even going to get to the more recent of the uh, important stuff. We're just going to be hitting some of the highlights here. And as I talk about some of these things, uh, a couple of things that you'll want to keep in mind. First of all, you are not responsible for knowing the first name of the people we're talking about nor are you responsible for knowing the dates of the discoveries that we're going to be talking about. I'm only giving the dates for you to have a kind of perspective of when these things were happening in history. You are responsible for knowing the last names of these individuals and you are responsible for knowing what they uh, did. So the names and their discoveries. So we're going to start here with Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke was uh, one of the individuals that was responsible for proving cell theory and actually I shouldn't even say proving as uh, you're aware um, we don't actually prove things we just uh, make um, the um, discoveries, we just uh, put forth the evidence that helps support the theory or the hypothesis. So um, Robert Hooke was uh, one of the individuals that was responsible for cell theory and uh, Hooke in 1665 said that all living things were made up of little boxes that he called cells and he was looking at plant cells and he was looking at plant cells using a magnifying glass or what we would um, think of as a magnifying glass uh, today so he was using a single lens so uh, he was, when you look at plant cells, uh, plant cells are very geometric. So if you look at something like cork or uh, the cells that make up uh, wood, you'll see that they are very geometric in their shape and so they do look very box-like and that is what Robert Hooke was seeing in 1665. Uh, other individuals uh, saw animal cells. Animal cells uh, are not as uh, geometric, not nearly as box-like as plant cells are. Uh, next we come to a man named von Leeuwenhoek. Von Leeuwenhoek is uh, what is uh, he's referred to as the father of microbiology and the reason he's referred to as the father of microbiology is that he developed what is referred to as the compound microscope. Von Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch fabric merchant and as many of you know when you buy things like sheets um, they uh, the quality of the fabric is measured by thread count. So um, he was trying to get the best view possible of the fabrics that he was buying and so he figured that if one lens was good to magnify that fabric 
then two lenses would be even better. And so von Leeuwenhoek used two lenses and your author is showing you a depiction of this here. So uh, they're showing you, uh, of course this is a replica, but uh, what they're showing you here at the top is both of the lenses there held into position. So when you have two lenses like this, it compounds your magnification. So if uh, one lens has 10 times the focusing power, and the next lens also has 10 times the magnification, then uh, with a compound microscope you multiply 10 times 10 and the total magnification is 100 times. And uh, that's what von Leeuwenhoek got. I'm not actually sure if it was 100 times, but he compounded the magnification. So uh, Von Leeuwenhoek started using his compound microscope to view a number of different things. He started off obviously looking at fabrics, but he got so interested that he started looking at a number of other things. So he started looking at scrapings from under people's fingernails, scrapings from people's teeth. He started looking at what would grow in the rain barrel. What would grow if he added things like grain to the rain barrel and let things grow? What would happen uh, if he let stuff grow in pond water? and so on. And he did drawings of what he was seeing. And these drawings have been preserved. And now we can see that what he was looking at under his compound microscope were bacteria, or at least many of them uh, appear to be bacteria. And of course then, uh, because uh, he was looking at these microorganisms under a compound microscope, again, von Leeuwenhoek is considered to be the father of microbiology. Okay, so uh, that brings us then to Pasteur. Louis Pasteur uh, did his uh, his work uh, many years after uh, Hook and von Leeuwenhoek. Um, Hook again was 1665, von Leeuwenhoek several years after that in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Pasteur uh, did not do his uh, work until the 1800s, late in the 1800s. Pasteur first uh, became, uh, I guess you would say famous, he, he first became published uh, uh, in the uh, 1860s uh, when he definitively disproved a biogenesis. A biogenesis uh, was initially referred to as the theory of spontaneous generation. Uh, spontaneous generation is the idea that life could arise from non-living material. So uh, in the 1800s, uh, many people, and certainly 
before the 1800s, many people, even many uh, scientists, believed that simple life certainly could arise from non-living material. So uh, if you think about it, in many ways this would seem to make sense. So if you had uh, meat that was not preserved or was not kept cold, after a day or so, uh, maggots, simple life, would seem to spontaneously erupt from that non-preserved meat. So that meat, of course, was not alive anymore and it would seem like that simple life form, those maggots, would arise pretty spontaneously from that dead tissue. Similarly, if you had soup that you had not uh, refrigerated in any way, if it wasn't cold, if it wasn't preserved, uh, uh, simple microbes would start to grow. Things like mold would start to grow on the surface of that soup after a day or so. So uh, these uh, simple life forms uh, would seem very spontaneous. So abiogenesis. There had been a couple of investigators prior to Pasteur that had tried to disprove this theory. Uh, Pasteur tried to uh, do this once before with um, simple straight neck flasks. So what Pasteur did is he took Oops, sorry. Pasteur took some very simple flasks, like so. And what he did is he would put some broth in there, uh, just some uh, beef broth, and let's see here. So he would put broth in both of these and he would heat one flask to boiling and not the other. And then after uh, he had the one heated up, he would stopper it. And then uh, what he would find, what happened then, is that if it was heated, gosh, this isn't working here. After it was uh, heated, the flask that had been uh, boiled up would not allow anything to grow in it. Whereas if it had been uh, allowed to sit and uh, had not been heated, stuff would begin to grow in it, uh, whether or not it had been stoppered. There were many, many uh, critics of this, and the primary one, uh, the primary uh, source of criticism, I should say, was that uh, many people said that if it was stoppered, there would not be sufficient oxygen left to support growth. Oxygen was frequently referred to as the life source. And uh, so uh, critics of this experiment said that stoppering the flask would not allow sufficient life source, not enough oxygen in the flask. And so Pasteur set about finding a better way uh, to disprove spontaneous generation. And he did so by using gooseneck or swan neck flasks. 
and this is what your author is showing you here with a more modern, of course, more modern representation. So with this, uh, Pasteur took the flasks again, uh, this time with a longer neck. And so he would again take the flasks, add the broth, But after the broth was added, he would uh, heat the actual neck of the flask and then curl it like so. Uh, some of you may be familiar, if you um, heat glass up enough, you can bend it like that very readily. And uh, this would allow the oxygen to come in, but it would not allow any uh, microbes to come in. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. So the broth was there. Uh, and then after the broth was added, he would bend the neck of the flask. And then he would heat one flask up to boiling and then let them sit for a day or two. And what he would find was, sure enough, in the one that had not been heated, stuff would grow. So there would be growth, growth of microbes only in the unheated flask. So this showed two things. First of all, that uh, microbes are present. Things too small to be seen with the naked eye could be present uh, in uh, non-living material and that they could be destroyed with heat. And this is the basis of the aseptic technique that we use today. Oops. So the basis of the aseptic technique that we use today. So uh, if we get back to that um, curve up there in the flask, uh, microorganisms can be present in air currents. So um, if, uh, for example, something is uh, blowing uh, along the floor, that can uh, blow bacteria along your floor. Um, but bacteria can't fly. So when uh, bacteria uh, are dropping down, those bacteria could drop down into the neck of the flask, but they can't fly up and over uh, that big curve up in there. So um, they use this now. Uh, when they set like a plumbing trap, this is why your pipes in your house have that curve on them. So it doesn't allow things to climb uh, up um, your, your plumbing trap, uh, or at least microorganisms and stuff like that. Things can't crawl in to your plumbing and such. So uh, Pasteur definitively disproved the theory of abiogenesis or spontaneously ge uh, spontaneous generation, and he established the basis of the aseptic technique, which we still use today. Uh, Pasteur did a number of other things, or at least he's credited with a number of other uh, things. He developed pasteurization. 
So when you buy milk, for example, it'll say it's pasteurized. So if we heat up milk to boiling, which is what uh, he did with the broth here, if you heat milk up to boiling, it will alter the protein in the milk. Uh, remember that proteins denature. So that would change the flavor of the milk, it will change the texture of the milk, uh, and uh, that was a big issue in Pasteur's day. Uh, there were actually a number of microorganisms and there were a number of diseases that you could get uh, through um, milk. For example, strep throat, tuberculosis. You could get these things from milk. Uh, so Pasteur wanted to find a way that he could treat milk uh, without boiling it. And he found uh, that if you heated the milk to just below boiling and kept it at that temperature for uh, several minutes but didn't allow it to boil, uh, for uh, about 20 minutes that it would destroy those pathogenic organisms. Uh, and uh, it didn't change the quality of the milk, it didn't change the taste of the milk, and it didn't alter those milk proteins in any way. So uh, pasteurization developed by Pasteur, of course, Pasteur also discovered how fermentation worked. Obviously, people have been fermenting things as long as there's been people. Uh, we've been fermenting grapes to make wine. Uh, we've been making bread, which is a form of fermentation, and so on. But it was Pasteur that figured out the actual chemical process, how that occurred. So Pasteur did a number of other things as well, and uh, I'll come back and talk about him when we get to vaccines.